Everyone quotes horsepower when they talk about railroad legends, and Union Pacific's big boy wears the marketing crown as the world's strongest engine. But when you are dragging 6,000 tons out of a mountain valley, horsepower is a lie. What matters is tractive effort, that raw bite between steel wheel and rail, the difference between a Ferrari and a bulldozer. So why did one railroad cheat on the scales, and what are you missing every time you look at a spec sheet? This is where the numbers and the truth begin to split. Horsepower gets all the headlines, but on the rails, it is not what gets a freight train moving. Here is what matters. Torque, the raw twisting force that shoves steel against steel. In railroad terms, that is tractive effort. Forget the marketing numbers for a minute. This is about the physics every engineer lives by. Picture a heavy door in an old shop. Horsepower is how fast you can sprint through once it is open. Tractive effort is how hard you can lean into it when it is stuck. On a locomotive, the door is never wide open. It is jammed by gravity, friction, a mile of loaded cars, and a grade that does not care about your top speed. The only thing that matters is whether you can get that door moving at all. Think of the grade as the thing that never forgives. Steam locomotives are built for this moment. Their secret weapon is maximum torque at zero miles per hour. The instant the throttle cracks open, all the force those cylinders can muster is right there, ready to twist the drivers. There is no waiting for the engine to spool up, no lag. The full grunt is on tap from the first turn of the wheel. That is why a steam engine can start a train that would leave a diesel spinning or a car stalled. It is not about speed, it is about bite. But that force comes with a warning. Too much tractive effort and the wheels slip, metal skates on metal, and the whole show stalls. That is why the weight pressing down on those drivers is just as important as the torque itself. The limit is not how much power you can make, it is how much you can actually use before the wheels let go. That is the edge every engineer walks, enough shove to get moving, but not so much you lose your grip. So when the spec sheets start throwing around horsepower, remember what actually gets a train started on a cold morning, facing a 1.2% grade. It is not the number in the brochure, it is the force at the railhead, the tractive effort waiting to bite before a single mile per hour has even registered on the dial. The rest is just how quickly you can run through the door once you have broken it loose. Union Pacific's big boy was not built for mountain switchbacks or tight curves. It was a purpose-built, high-speed hauler designed to keep freight moving across the long, rolling grades between Ogden and Cheyenne. The numbers on the spec sheet tell the story, but only if you know where to look. Start with the boiler. Big boy runs at 300 pounds per square inch. That is a figure you do not just throw around. Every inch of that boiler is under a pressure that would turn a garden hose into confetti. But pressure alone is not the magic. The real question is what does that pressure do at the railhead? That is where tractive effort comes in. Big Boy's starting tractive effort is rated at 135,375 pounds force. That is the raw twist, the shove delivered straight to the rails before the locomotive even moves. It is not a number you see in glossy ads, but it is the one every engineer cares about when there are 4,000 tons of freight behind the drawbar. But here is where it gets interesting. That force does not mean a thing if the wheels cannot grip. Big Boy puts down 540,000 pounds on its 16 driving wheels. That is 33,750 pounds per wheel, each one pressing a steel rim against a steel rail. The math is simple but unforgiving. Take the weight on the drivers and divide by the starting tractive effort. For Big Boy, that is 540,000 divided by 135,375. The answer is 3.99. That number, 3.99, is not just a curiosity. In steam locomotive design, it is the golden mean. Engineers call it the factor of adhesion. Too low and you are skating. Too high and you are hauling dead weight. At 3.99, Big Boy is balanced right on the edge. All the force the cylinders can muster is usable at the rail without the wheels breaking loose. That is no accident. 
it is the result of careful design, not marketing bravado. So when Big Boy leans into a heavy train at the base of a grade, every pound of that 135,375 is ready to work. The rails bite, the drivers dig in, and the whole consist starts to move. It is not about how fast you are going, it is about how much you can move from a dead stop without a hint of slip. That is the difference between a number in a brochure and a locomotive that earns its keep. This is the math that matters. The pressure in the boiler, the weight on the wheels, the force at the railhead. The next time someone throws out a horsepower figure, ask them what the factor of adhesion is. If they do not know, they are reading the wrong part of the spec sheet. Will Woodard didn't just design locomotives, he rewrote the playbook. At Lima Locomotive Works, pronounced Lai M-A, not Lima, Woodard championed what he called superpower. This was not a marketing label. It was an engineering doctrine built on one idea. Sustained force wins the mountain, not flashy numbers. The heart of superpower is the firebox. Woodard pushed for fireboxes so wide and deep, they looked oversized even by steam standards. The Allegheny's firebox sprawled over 105 square feet of grate, swallowing bituminous coal at a rate that would bury a lesser locomotive. That massive firebox fed a boiler built for volume, not just pressure. While Union Pacific chased 300 pounds per square inch for the big boy, Woodard settled on 260 pounds per square inch. That number was not a compromise. It was the sweet spot, high enough for serious steam, but low enough to keep the boiler healthy under relentless firing. In the shop memos, the focus was not just on peak numbers, but on how many British thermal units you could burn, how much steam you could push, and how long you could keep the cylinders fed on a hard pull. Every inch of the Allegheny was shaped by this thinking. The two 666 wheel arrangement, the gigantic boiler, the deep combustion chamber, all of it aimed at one job dragging thousands of tons up the Allegheny grades without a pause. Woodard's doctrine made the locomotive heavier, more demanding on the rails, but it paid off in tractive effort that did not fade when the run got tough. That is why the Allegheny's numbers on paper always looked modest, until you saw what it did in the real world. Superpower was not about chasing speed, it was about building a machine that could outgrind anything else on the rails hour after hour, ton after ton. Coal country doesn't care about horsepower. In the Alleghenies, the only number that matters is how much weight you can get moving, uphill, around a curve, with a hundred hoppers behind you. The Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad ran deep into West Virginia, where the grades could hit 1.5% and the curves squeezed every inch out of a locomotive's frame. The Allegheny's firebox was built to swallow bituminous coal, the kind that burns hot and dirty, dug straight from the mines it was meant to haul. Bituminous coal packs more energy than the sub-bituminous coal found out west, which meant the fireman could keep up a furious pace, feeding a boiler that never caught its breath. The Appalachians didn't offer the luxury of long, gentle climbs. Every mile was a fight against gravity and friction. On these grades, the difference between moving and stalling comes down to the weight pressing the drivers into the rail. That is why the Allegheny's designers did not chase top speed, they chased mass. Every ton added to the drivers was another pound of bite when the wheels tried to slip. But heavy engines come with a price. The more weight you put on the rail, the more you risk breaking it. Axle load was not just an engineering headache, it was a regulatory tripwire. Go too heavy and the railroad paid out in fines or faced expensive track upgrades. Still, the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad kept pushing. The Allegheny rolled out with a declared weight that fit within the paper limits, but in practice, the numbers crept higher. That extra heft was not just dead weight, it was the secret source for mountain service. On the steepest grades, the Allegheny's true advantage was not in the numbers printed in the spec book, but in the raw, unyielding force it could put to the rail. That is why, for the crews grinding up out of Hinton, tractive effort always outranked horsepower. The mountain decided what mattered, and the Allegheny was built to answer.
On the books, the C and O Allegheny looked like it just squeezed under the wire. The paperwork filed with regulators showed a locomotive that met the official weight limits, keeping axle loads right at the threshold the Interstate Commerce Commission allowed. But the real story started in the shops, not the office. Real, not paperwork. When the first H8 engines rolled onto the scales at Huntington, the numbers did not match the blueprints. The engine came in tens of tons heavier than the diagrams claimed, enough to send the mechanical department scrambling for explanations. Scales told a different story. There was money on the line. Every pound over the declared weight meant more cash out the door, track damage fines, higher maintenance costs, and even potential route restrictions. The Interstate Commerce Commission did not care how much coal you could move. They cared if your locomotive was pulverizing their rails. For a railroad built on Appalachian coal, those fines added up fast. So C&O reported the numbers that kept the lawyers happy and the trains moving, not the numbers the scale showed at midnight. Rails mattered more than reputation. That decision did not stay hidden. Crews noticed the difference in pay because their contracts tied bonuses to weight on drivers. When the reways finally surfaced, C&O faced a bill for thousands in back pay. Worse, the railroad sued Lima in 1944, demanding millions for damages tied to the misrepresented weight. The case made waves in the industry. It was not just about a line on a spec sheet. It was about the cost of pushing the limits and who would pick up the tab when the metal proved heavier than the math. Back pay came with consequences. But here is the twist. All that extra weight was not just a liability, it was leverage. More steel pressing down on the drivers meant more bite at the railhead. The hidden tonnage quietly boosted the Allegheny's factor of adhesion, giving it an edge where it mattered most, starting a loaded coal train on a mountain grade without slipping. The scandal was not just a matter of fines and lawsuits. It was the secret behind the Allegheny's real-world dominance in the hills, a case where cheating the paperwork handed the crews a better tool than the accountants ever intended. The real revelation comes when you run the numbers on the Allegheny's factor of adhesion. On the spec sheet, the C and O claimed a starting tractive effort of about 110,200 pounds. That's a headline figure, but it's only half the story. The real question is how much weight those six pairs of drivers are pressing into the rail. Official paperwork put the weight on drivers somewhere around 780,000 pounds, but that number was as slippery as the rails in a rainstorm. When the mechanical department finally put an H8 on the scales, no fudge, no wishful thinking, the engine came in tens of tons heavier than promised. That extra steel wasn't just a paperwork headache, it was the secret ingredient. Factor of adhesion is simple math. Weight on drivers divided by starting tractive effort. For the Allegheny, using the numbers the railroad whispered in the back office, you are looking at a factor that quietly climbs above the magic number 4.0 not just on the line, but over it. In practical terms, that means the Allegheny's wheels had more bite than the spec sheet ever admitted. More weight pressing down means more grip before the drivers even think about slipping. The extra tonnage, hidden from the lawyers and the ICC, gave the mountain crews a margin of safety the spec book never promised. This is where the marketing sash falls off and the real crown shows up. On paper, the Allegheny was a beast. On the rails, with all that hidden weight, it was a monster. The numbers don't just tell a story, they deliver the verdict. When you see a factor of adhesion above 4.0, you are not looking at wasted steel. You are looking at a locomotive that can start a loaded coal train on a 1.5% grade and keep the wheels biting all the way to the crest. That's not a headline. That's the difference between a train that moves and a train that slips back down the hill. For the crews in the cab, it wasn't about what the brochure said. It was about what the locomotive delivered when the mountain fought back. Flat track favors the thoroughbred. Out on the high plains, where the grades are gentle and the horizon stretches for miles, the big boy is in its element. 16 drivers, 300 psi in the boiler, and a top speed that only a handful of steam locomotives could touch. On a long, straight run between Ogden and Cheyenne, the big boy could keep a hundred cars rolling at 50 miles an hour, 
hour after hour without breaking a sweat. That's where horsepower pays off, steady speed, long distances, and the kind of schedule that makes a dispatcher smile. But the Allegheny was never meant for the prairie. Its job started at the foot of the mountain, facing a wall of coal cars and a grade that didn't care how fast you could go. Here, the only thing that mattered was getting the train moving at all. With a firebox built to swallow bituminous coal and a boiler tuned for relentless torque, the Allegheny could dig in and start a loaded train on a 1.5% grade where lesser engines would slip or stall. It wasn't about velocity, it was about brute force at the railhead. So the verdict is clear. On the flatlands, the big boy wears the crown. In the mountains, the Allegheny rules. Each king in its own country, each built for a different kind of fight. Spec sheets don't care about legends, they care about numbers. Start at the top, wait on drivers. That's your anchor, think 600 tons pressing steel into steel. Next, find the starting tractive effort. If it is not front and center, dig for it. That is the raw shove, the number that decides whether you move a mountain or just spin your wheels. Now check the factor of adhesion. Divide the weight on drivers by the tractive effort. If it is around 4.0, you are looking at a locomotive that knows how to grip. Much higher, and you are hauling dead weight. Much lower, and you are skating on the edge. Boiler pressure comes next, but do not get hypnotized. High pressure sounds impressive, but it is only as good as the firebox and the fuel behind it. Last, the fuel type. Is it burning bituminous or subbituminous coal? That tells you how hot and how long it can keep up the fight. Forget the headline, horsepower. The real story is in the numbers that bite the rail and hold the train. That is how you spot the king, not by the crown, but by the 600 ton footprint it leaves behind. Spec sheets still shout horsepower, but every ton moved uphill proves what really matters. As modern railways chase efficiency, the quiet math of tractive effort shapes every design, every load, every dollar earned. The steel giants of yesterday remind us, real power isn't what is promised, but what actually moves the world. The next time you see numbers, remember to look for the bite, not just the brag. Drop your thoughts below.